Hello, this is Michael Kiley. I'm the founder of Creative Growth Coach, which is a series of courses I'm offering based on content from my 25 years of teaching enhanced creativity in a class called Visual Thinking. This presentation is about two of my favorite topics, flow state, which is said by some to be the most pleasurable mental, mental state that we humans can experience, and lateral thinking, which is a little more nuanced term for creative thinking. And my bottom line with flow states is why not spend as much time as possible in this mental condition of invention and ecstasy. Let's get into it. Here's one definition of flow. And I like this part, I like the whole definition, but performing an activity that is fully immersed, which is why you can't be creative or get into flow when you're multitasking or completely stressed out. A key thing is you're actually doing something, making something, and you are so fully involved, there's a time distortion where time just goes incredibly slowly and you're kind of shocked that three or four hours has passed by. So it's completely focused motivation, single-mindedness, which I do have trouble with at times, but not when I'm making something and harnessing our emotions in the service of performing and learning. The emotions are positive, energized, and they align with the task at hand. The hallmark of flow is a feeling of spontaneous joy, even to the extent of rapture, while performing a task. I will post the link to this video on my site for my course, um, but Stephen Kotler is a brilliant man, and this video uh, is kind of incredible because he talks about the pleasure neurochemistry of flow states. How to achieve it? Well. Relaxation through meditation feels good. Technically, many people think it's not actually flow. It's more preparing the ground to get into flow. Taking a hike, doing something physical, physical running, uh, paddling on the water, uh, many, many types of physical activity can induce flow. And that's one reason why some people have a positive addic addiction to running. Crafting objects, making art, writing, creative activity, these are classic spaces where flow happens. And just lately I'll use my own recent example, going sailing. I'm new enough at it that I just, I'm, I'm not, I'm a little bit worried, but I'm also just so involved in it because there's all these physical forces of the boat healing. Where's the wind coming from? How am I trying, where am I trying to get to? And there's a link I'll put also on my site, but it's, 20 reasons why the shower is so conducive to new ideas. And I bet almost all of us have maybe been aiming at a problem, trying to solve it. Maybe it's very important to solve it as soon as possible, not getting anywhere. We finally just give up. We go take a shower and the classic flow happens in the shower and the answers come. You might want to even write down an answer on a piece of paper, but what sort of problem were you focused on the last time an answer popped in your head and what was the circumstance of when the idea popped up? The feeling of flow it what is what gets us hooked and coming back to it. I think it's a positive addiction 
I use music to get into flow, but I have no musical talent. So I would just love to have that experience of a talented musician drops into this state where it's just him or her and the instrument. And again, thinking about other times you've had flow, if you are a musician, I would guess you have had experiences while playing an instrument. So I enjoy some of the talent shows and I think particularly young people at some peak moment, maybe for the first time showing what they can do. And this musician, Marcin, who's from Poland, he's just off the charts doing things with the guitar I didn't think were possible. And you can tell how passionately he's involved. So the relationship there between flow and ecstasy and that's not a word you commonly use, but it's a type of mental creative ecstasy. Apologies for this blurry slide, but flow in composing music, I'll read it. You are in an ecstatic state to such a point that you feel as though you almost don't exist. I have experienced this time and again my hand seems to be devoid of myself, and I have nothing to do with what is happening. I just sit, sit there watching it in a state of awe and wonderment, and the music just flows out of itself. So not to be too repetitive, but complete involvement this sense of ecstasy, of being outside daily reality and worries, an inner clarity. You have to kind of know the activity is doable, that you have the necessary skills to complete the task so you won't drop into flow if you're the first time ever picking up a guitar and trying to teach yourself how to play it, or at least not very likely. You lose your sense of self and kind of all the outside world drops away, losing track of time, which is kind of a wonderful feeling. And your motivation is intrinsic. So you're not just trying to make a buck or make a drawing so somebody thinks you're wonderfully talented. It's very internal. It's funny what people do seeking happiness. I like this question, who's very happy? I actually say I'm pretty happy most of the time. Mihaly Chichinkmiai, he made this term, he created this term of flow, and he said it was the secret to happiness. And this blurry chart is sort of related to a thing that having been around a lot of people of great wealth, and I don't have that, but I'm comfortable, um, the people that keep chasing a second million dollars after they've made one, and then after they've made five, they want 20. Uh, those people and their family members, it's less likely to increase your happiness. Basically, it's very hard to be happy if you're starving to death or ill. But financially, people that are at least like comfortable middle class, it doesn't make much difference to go up in terms of wealth. So this is about, yes, we can actually induce flow and we can also destroy flow. And I made this, this is a mind map, something I'm really into. And I'll explain later, but there's an app I use in my online teaching extensively called VoiceThread. And it's essentially, it's a slideshow. And I actually am making this video with VoiceThread. I create the slideshow images, I narrate it. And then after I've recorded my comments, I send it to people and people can look at the slide and express their own thoughts through voice. So that's why it's called VoiceThread. The tagline of the company is conversations in the cloud. And I'm gonna be using it uh, in this case, if you went to this link, you could there'll be an image of this slide and you could leave comments. And basically I'm just going to mock that up now. 
What's the number one destroyer of my flow? Uh, well, it's I can't do flow when I'm really stressed or worrying about things or when I'm rushing for some outside appointment. From my own personal experience, well, I have flow a lot of the times when I'm designing and building furniture, which is my main business. And it's great to have a business you love. And of course, there's always tough moments too, but that's why I think I've been a woodworker since I was seven years old. How can you induce flow? Well, you can go for a jog, or you could start making a drawing without any kind of critical voice and without it needing to be impressive to other people. It's easy to destroy flow. It's easy to induce flow. So why not choose this one? And it's, it, I don't, it might get you in flow to have a conversation, but a big point about creativity is spend time with right brain friends. We all have left and right but spend time with people that you regard as creative. It's a, it's, it will get you more comfortable with your own creativity. The class I taught for so long is called visual thinking. So I love graphics. And if you want to communicate with me, it's a lot better to have images rather than text. Although I understand text well, I thought this was a very nice uh, scene from an animation that these components, the goal has to be clear. So it's a decision to make a painting, a decision to go on a run that's longer than anyone you've done in a year. Uh, it'll give you immediate feedback. So as a woodworker, I'll be making something and I feel a degree of mastery. And then, oh, I messed up something. That's the feedback. And then sometimes you do something that's irreversible but often it's just like, okay, I can just keep going with that. It's a part of involving me. You have to be doing something that's challenging, but not in an overwhelming way. So when I taught, I could compel people to do their homework and my class was a fun class. So I didn't just have the usual take an examination, study for a quiz, write a long essay, Right, right, read 100 pages of a difficult book, but if you're not my student, or maybe you will be my student, um, just try this. Like, if you get a sense of flow, decide that in the next day or two, you're going to take 45 minutes free in your schedule, and you're going to try and, and induce flow. It could be through exercise, making a painting, writing something. Uh, there's a million things you can do. Then, then do that one session within two days, then take a break, try and actually avoid flow for 24 hours. And then after that's over, induce flow again, and try some other realm. If it was physical, make it more artistic. Uh, I've done this experiment with hundreds of students, and we pretty much all found out that we could make flow happen more during a daily basis and you cannot live in flow, but why not have flow every day? So I used to think that everyone knew what lateral thinking is, but turns out to me it's synonymous and has a more kind of accurate theory behind it about how to be creative. But turns out many people are like, hmm, lateral thinking, don't quite know. Uh, lateral thinking was a book written in the 60s by Edward de Bono. And as far as I know, it was the first book that ever said, there's not a mystery to being created. There's a methodology. Read this book, do the exercises, and you will enhance your creativity. And I found that to be true. So let me talk a little bit more about what lateral thinking is versus vertical. I don't totally buy into this paradigm of left brain, right brain, but it's not a bad abstraction. The only thing organic brain wise that I've ever read uh, has anything physical that some people are more creative is, I believe it's the corpus callosum connects the two hemispheres and people that have a percentily larger connector seem to be more creative. And it is coincidentally or not, I think not, 
it's propor it's proportionally larger in women. Um, are you more of a vertical thinker? I'll talk more about what that is, and or more of a lateral thinking. So, I think I've always been highly lateral, creative thinking, but I do know logic, and I don't know that balance is necessary or good. But some people are pretty balanced. And I think we're all pretty familiar with vertical thought and having been a university teacher for more than 25 years, I felt like I was a bit out of place because so much of the coursework in other classes was vertical. And it's not that vertical is bad. It's just that if you can't get out of vertical, you can't be creative. And if you can't be creative, you're not going to really have big dreams. So without a big dream, the dream never happens. So faced with a problem, and that's kind of the crux of this, faced with a problem, and if it's kind of urgently important to find an answer, you search for ideas, you try and find ideas that pop into your head that appear to be, maybe that'll work. In the vertical thinking mode, one is always trying to select the various, the, the very best idea. The problem is, in the lateral mode, you switch off any thought about critique or selection or which one's best because it messes up your creative thinking. Vertical thinking is analytical. I would say my brother is a brilliant person and far more analytical than I, but I certainly need my vertical thought to solve my problems. And of course, vertical thinking is sequential, like a logical syllogism. All men are mortal. All Greeks are men, all Greeks are mortal. I actually took a class in logic in high school and I loved it. Um, so here's weird things about lateral thinking. You don't just desperately search for something that will fix your problem and grab the first plausible one. With lateral thinking, one continues generating many approaches even after the first promising idea has been discovered. So you're jotting down a big list and you're gonna keep going past the first, like, okay, I think that might work. And you're generating concepts for the sake of generating them. So it's a quantity thing. I say in creativity, quantity leads to quality. So sometimes I just make a list I write down a problem, I make a list of numbers from 1 to 30, and I say I'm going to write down 30 ideas. In fact, I did that when I first started this YouTube channel. I just made a list of 50 ideas for videos, or 52, so I had a video idea for every week. Lateral thinking is provocative, and it's particularly when you do lateral thinking, brainstorming process in a group, you try and benevolently push the other people. And lateral thinking can make jumps all over the place and that drives some people crazy. And I wouldn't want a doctor who's doing some medical procedure on me to just start jumping around. I'd want him to be very vertical, but it's like you just get into the fact that, God, all these ideas are interesting and you're just spewing them out. And the moment you turn to pra practical thinking or logic, uh, you, you've ended the generative part. And we can't, we don't need to live in either of these states, but it's in my impression, particularly as a teacher, school seemed to make people more concerned with being right about stuff and to the extent sometimes regurgitate, regurgitating things rather than discovering and making the new thing. I won't read the whole list, um, but with Lateral thought, you just move, but with vertical thinking, you're like, mm, how am I going to save $20,000 to buy a car? So there's specifics. And then it's about being right. So you don't just come up with ideas that are just random and you know useless to the problem. I don't think about making a watercolor painting when I'm trying to figure out how to raise money to buy something I want. I'll skip through these. I think you get the idea. But vertical thinking is by nature, and I should go like this. It's vertical. No, not like that. It's like this. It's uh, highly sequential. And of course, you have to be correct at every step in a math problem. 
And the, the big problem is if you flip back and forth with moment to moment, vertical, lateral, vertical, lateral, the negative messes up the flow in a generative state. So you can't recover uh, just like you can't recover from a d outside distraction so quickly. And you're trying to immediately exclude the irrelevant. Vertical thinking follows the most likely paths. So synonymous with creative, creativity, but I think there's this more specific methodology to lateral thought. It's extremely generative. I believe five-year-olds, unless they've been really deprived, are tending to be all creative geniuses. And that's why they can not hesitate to say something other people might think is stupid about something they might do or dream of or a way they might solve a problem. You get in movement in lateral thinking to, to get direction. Uh, I, in my 20s, I was very involved in my painting work, and I found I could, I could have an idea for a painting, but the only way I could get to the end point of a good painting was to start putting my, paint, my paintbrush into paint and painting as soon as possible. Huge difference here. All that really matters in lateral thinking, which is partly about brainstorming, is the richness of the ideas. And you continue generating as many approaches as you can, even after something promising has come up. So as I said, I make, okay, I'm going to think of 20 ideas, and then I'll pick one. I'm not going to get to the fourth one and go, oh, that's pretty good. I'll go with it. Really a big problem when you're doing things like thinking about going to graduate school, just as an example, you decide first, you get into the vertical and you think about all the things you can't afford that you're not whatever smart enough to get into. And then you end up not going to Yale, which might have been wonderful for you and might have been achievable. Provocative, we talked about that. We need to provoke ourselves. So like, that's a lot of like, what if? What if I did this? Here's this situation. How could I do that? What if I did that? What if I tried that? What if the circumstance was different? And you intrinsically make jumps all over the place. And I love that you don't have to be correct in every step. You can't possibly be correct in every step while you're making a work of art. Big turnoff in group brainstorming is when somebody is like downing ideas or even just rolling their eyes at ideas because that period of time, whether it's five minutes or an hour, needs to have no negativity and no critique, which is hard for some people. Welcome chance intrusions. I'll talk about that in a minute. And you explore sometimes the least likely paths. So which form comes more naturally for you, lateral or vertical? So some people are very prone to being control freaky about chance intrusions and accidents. And no, I'm not talking about a meteorite coming down and blowing up my car, but think about travel. So some people want the most absolutely controlled experience of travel, um, Viking cruises, which I'm sure is lovely, but their tagline is explore the world in comfort. Well, if you're not open to some discomfort in traveling, uh, I don't think the trip will be as interesting. And I know sometimes in travel, something's gone haywire and it led to the most wonderful people, the most wonderful stumbling upon a restaurant. So welcoming chance intrusions is a good attitude to have to, when you want to be creative. So I love dogs and I don't think the puppy was harmed. However, this happened, but it's kind of ridiculous to be stuck between these trees and not quite know how to get out of there. So it's humorous as long as the puppy's not in pain. Um, one of the most famous comics of the 70s and onward, uh, just the wackiness of Steve, just 
like he was and he was also he really was a new type of comic so people didn't they didn't not sometimes they didn't understand his jokes but they also didn't understand the form of the comedy and even more extreme someone whose comedy genius andy kaufman was maybe bordering on multi-personality disorder insanity uh, possibly he'd got violent a few times, but what a off the charts, brilliant performer. And one of my all time favorite videos is a, is a, a video of a song by REM called Man on the Moon. And it's full of these kind of intuitive lunges into different mixes of images. So I could go on and on, but here's one of the best portraits ever taken of Dali, the surrealist. Obviously, it's staged, and I think it took many takes to get the photograph right. And this is so right for this artist. And basically, when they took the shot, the chair was hanging, the easel was hanging on monofilament, this stuff was hanging. Uh, they Dali would jump with a mad expression on his face at the same time somebody tossed cats who hopefully landed on their feet and somebody else tossed buckets of water to catch this moment of crazy humor. Man Ray, I could go on and on about him, so I'll do that in another video. One of my favorite artists, he's a photographer and a painter, and the guy just had a sense of fun his whole life, and costume parties were in vogue. And here's a model of his and just how fun to not be so serious. And here he's wearing like a turban with an actual starfish stuck on his head. He just had a great sense of play and playfulness, I think, is intrinsic to creativity. Here's a wild photograph by Man Ray. Um, so lateral thinkers. Creative people should be playful. Little kids have a great sense of humor usually. And I kind of don't trust people that don't have any sense of humor. Uh, but just imagine, you could even jot this down, but think of, just imagine this photograph came from a title. Just jot down or just think of two completely different titles that might be appropriate to this photograph, which was very carefully composed by Man Ray. So I've worked as an architect and I did a lot of interior architecture and the people I worked for were nice, but they tended to be this so tasteful, so beige, so, so uncontroversial. It's amazing that people with money kind of take, maybe it's calming, but it's also kind of the safe bet. And here's one of the great decorator geniuses, Tony Duquette. Yeah, this would be kind of hard to live in. This is his house. And it's just, to me, an interesting contrast with that. Um, so a creative environment can nurture us if we're, some people, I, I talk not in this video, but about a creative sanctuary. Sometimes for people that's out in nature, sometimes it's a very simple space. And I myself need a bunch of tools and materials and kind of stimulation. So just thinking about the creativity of the spaces we're in. While flow feels great, it's not the same as leisure. It tends to have a much higher energy level. It involves things that are useful and challenging, so take that as you will, uh, and progress towards a goal. I'm starting a painting. It's going to take me a month. I work on it every day. Uh, that's like a good flow example. And then it gives you feedback like, oh, this painting, I'm not doing too good with this, or uh, this is feeling just right, like I'm finding the edge of what, what this thing I'm making should be. Just to give you some ideas, I mean, I think we've all had flow experiences. I think we have a few things at least that we know are predictably going to get us into flow at least some of the time. I guess for me, it's like art, painting, listening to music, 
physical activity for sure, but not extreme things. Um, woodworking, yeah, I've been doing that forever. Uh, yeah, I love being around animals. Gardening, not so much until lately. So there's activities that would not. I tried sewing when I was young, and it stressed me out. So just what are your flow activities? There's there's so many. Like what? There's things that can't probably be flow, but so much that can be. So why not live in flow as much as possible? So it's a really big question. But let's make it in the here and now. What are what are the obstacles to your creativity? We all have them. Some people are completely blocked or stuck. And in fact, those two words, I feel stuck. That's a time when you actually need to move into the lateral mode and get out of the vertical mode. Um, but what's, what's the obstacles now? And I really, one of my greatest pleasures, I think it is my greatest pleasure as a teacher, is to help people get unstuck, to discover their more creative side. And I wrote a whole list of myths about creativity. And one of the most, the biggest ones often is just being unable to get into new spaces and places and try something different. So I'm going to give you one technique that could help with any sort of time you're stuck creatively or not enjoying trying to make or do something. It's from one of my favorite books called Creativity and Business. And when you're wrestling with something, let's say you're making a painting. I just go back to that example because it's something I do. And then you're going, oh, it's just not working. And you get stressed. You get very self-judgmental. You might get critical. You're just not feeling good. Well, I used to give students this. I didn't want my students to feel burdened. So I would give them a project assignment to do over the next week. And I'd say, experiment with follow this, make this object based on what the project says, and then try the three E's. So as much as possible, do the work in ways that are entirely easy, effortless, and enjoyable. And in fact, yes, it's possible to actually make something incredible while you're in those states of mind versus struggling and stressing. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation that was useful. Um, and I hope you'll check out my courses that I've developed at creativegrowth.coach. I'm basically I always felt as a teacher, I was almost more of a guide or coach, just trying to get the right circumstance set up. And all my teaching, almost all of it has been based on uh, experiential learning and project-based learning because I, I never enjoyed the reading, writing, arithmetic with lots of tests and uh, critical thoughts from the teacher. So hope you have a good week. I hope some of this is helpful and I'll talk to you soon.